Okay. John has got some, a theme that we're going to see throughout this gospel, and it is that Jesus Christ uh, came and he is... Now, Luke, Luke and the others have, have spent some energies in showing that, that Jesus was truly man. Now, God, uh, I mean, John is going to show that, that, John, that Jesus was truly God. He is, he is deity. And also, he's writing these things, so, and, and there's, we're going to see this throughout the passages, is, uh, so that you can see that Jesus is the Christ, and that seeing that, you will believe and therefore have life. And so that's the theme of John. And, and, and let's go ahead and get started with the, uh, the videos, Norman, and then we'll take off from there. We have two videos tonight. The Gospel According to John. It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and we learn at the end of the book that it comes from one of Jesus' closest followers called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later church as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly designed with a clear purpose that he states near the end. John says, The story is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John believes that the Jesus you read about in this book is alive and real, and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is really cool. Its first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story that's followed by then a big block of stories about Jesus performing miraculous signs that generate increasing controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign, the raising of Lazarus, which creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half. So the book opens with a two-part introduction. First, a poem that begins, in the beginning, was the Word, an obvious allusion to Genesis 1, when God created everything with his Word. Now, a person's words, they're distinct from that person, but they're also the embodiment of that person's mind and will. And so John says that God's Word was with God, that is distinct. And yet the word was God, that is divine. And as we ponder this claim, we hear later in the poem that this divine word became human in Jesus. Then John goes on to draw from the stories of Exodus, saying that Jesus was God's tabernacle in our midst. The glorious divine presence that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant became a human in Jesus. Which leads to his last claim, that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Son, who has become human to reveal the Father to us. Now, as we consider these mind-bending claims, we then start to hear a story about how John the Baptist first met Jesus and then led other people to meet him and become his disciples. And one by one, as people encounter Jesus, they say out loud who they think he is. And in this one chapter, Jesus is given seven titles. Now, these titles prepare us for John's love of sevens in designing the book, but altogether they also make a claim that this fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king, he's the teacher of Israel, and he's the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. Now that's a big claim to make about someone, and John will now go on to support it through the stories in chapters 2 through 12. They all have the same basic pattern. Jesus will perform a sign or make a claim about himself, and that will result in misunderstanding or controversy. And so in the end of each story, people are forced to make a choice about who they think Jesus is. The first section shows Jesus encountering four classic Jewish institutions, and in each case, Jesus shows that he is the reality to which that institution pointed. So Jesus is at a wedding party, and the wine runs out, and Jesus then turns these huge jugs of water, like 120 gallons total, into the best wine ever. And the head waiter says to the groom, you've saved the best wine for last. Which is, of course, true, but John also calls this miracle Jesus' first sign. In other words, it's a symbol that reveals something about Jesus. So just as Isaiah said that the messianic kingdom would be like this huge party with lots of good wine, so this first miraculous sign reveals the generosity of Jesus' kingdom. 
Next, Jesus goes to the Jerusalem temple, the place where heaven and earth were supposed to come together and God would meet with his people. And Jesus asserts his authority over it, running out all the money exchangers, stopping the sacrificial offerings. And when the temple leaders threaten him, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is claiming that his coming sacrificial death is where heaven and earth will truly meet together. His body that will be killed is the reality to which the temple building points. Then Jesus has this all-night conversation with a rabbi named Nicodemus who thinks that Jesus is just like him, another rabbi and teacher for Israel. But Jesus says that Israel needs much more than just another teacher with new information. Israel needs a new heart and a new life. Or in his words, no one can experience God's kingdom without being born again. Jesus believes that humans are caught in a web of selfishness and sin that leads to death. But he also knows that God loves this world. And so he's here to offer people a new birth, a new chance at life. From here, Jesus travels north and he ends up at a sacred well in a conversation with a Samaritan, that is a non-Jewish woman. And they start talking about water, which Jesus turns into a metaphor for himself. He says he's here to bring living water that can become a source of eternal life. Now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that's infused with God's eternal love, and it's a life that can begin now and last on into the future. After this, John has designed another collection of stories that took place during four Jewish sacred days, or feasts. And again, Jesus uses the images related to the feasts to make claims about himself. So Jesus first heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, which starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. And Jesus says it's his father who's working on the Sabbath, and so is he. And they catch his meaning, that he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God, and so they want to kill him. The next story takes place during Passover, the feast that retold the Exodus story with the symbolic meal of the lamb and bread and wine. And Jesus miraculously provides food for a crowd of thousands, which results in people asking him for more bread. And then Jesus goes on to claim that he is the true bread, and if they eat him, they will discover eternal life. And this offends many people who stop following him. After this is a block of stories set in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, which retold the story of Israel's wilderness wanderings as God guided them with the pillar of cloud and fire and provided them water in the desert. And Jesus gets up in the temple courts and he shouts, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And then later he says, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be the illuminating presence of God and the life-saving gift of God to his people. And some people believe and follow him, but others are offended and still others try to kill him for these exalted claims. The final feast story is during Hanukkah, which means rededication. It's about how Judah Maccabee cleared the temple of idols and set it apart as holy once more. And Jesus goes into the temple area and says that he is the one whom God has set apart as the Holy One, and that he is the true temple where God's presence dwells. And he also says, I and the Father are one. This makes the Jerusalem leaders so angry, they set in motion a plan to kill Jesus, and so he retreats from the city. Now, all these conflicts, they culminate in one last miraculous sign. Jesus hears that his dear friend Lazarus is sick, but his family lives near Jerusalem, which is now a death trap for Jesus. Now, Jesus could stay away and he would save his own life, but he loves Lazarus. So once he hears that Lazarus has died, he goes to raise him from the dead and he calls him to life out of his tomb, knowing that it will cost him his own life. And the news of this amazing sign, it spreads quickly, of course, and just as Jesus knew it happened, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and begin conspiring to murder him. And so he rides into Jerusalem as Israel's king, who's rejected by its leaders. So the first half of John draws to a close with this story about Jesus laying down his life as an act of love for his friend. And this, of course, is also a sign pointing forward to the cross, which we'll explore more in the next video. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel of John. The Gospel According to John In the first video, we saw that John wrote this book to make the claim that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the human embodiment of God's word and glorious presence who has come to reveal who God truly is. 
Then we explored how John designed the first half of the book to demonstrate this claim. Jesus performed miraculous signs and made huge claims about himself, that he is the reality to which Israel's entire history points. And this all generates controversy, however, and the Jewish leaders confront Jesus for all these claims, and it culminated with Jesus laying down his life for his friend Lazarus. By going near Jerusalem to raise him from the dead, Jesus sealed his fate. And so once the plot to murder Jesus is set in motion, we come into the book's second half. The first part focuses entirely on Jesus' final night and last words to the disciples as he tries to prepare them for his coming death. Jesus performs this shocking act at dinner. He takes on the role of a common servant by kneeling down to wash their dirty feet, something that in their culture a superior rabbi would never do for his disciples. And Jesus says it's a symbol of his entire life purpose— to reveal the true nature of God as a being of self-giving love. And it's also a symbol of what Jesus is about to do in becoming a servant and giving up his life to die for the sins of the world. And so this act leads to his great command to his disciples that they are to follow him by loving one another as he has loved them. Acts of loving generosity are to be the hallmark of Jesus' followers. This is what will show the world who Jesus is and therefore who God is. Now from here, Jesus goes into a long flowing speech that's concluded with a prayer. And you'll find the whole thing is unified by a few repeated themes. Jesus keeps saying that he's going away, which makes the disciples sad. But Jesus says it's for the best because it means that he will send the Spirit, also known as the Advocate. As a human, Jesus can only be in one place at a time, but the Spirit can be Jesus' divine, personal presence in any place at any time. And the Spirit will do a number of things, Jesus says. So remember, for John, the unique deity of the one God consists of that loving, unified relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus says the Spirit is that loving, personal presence that will come to live in his people and draw them into the love between the Father and the Son. And so, Jesus says, his disciples are the ones who abide or remain in that divine love, the way that branches are connected to a vine. He's describing here how the personal love of God can permeate a person's life, healing, transforming, and making them new. And there's more. The Spirit will also empower Jesus' followers to carry on his mission in the world, to first of all fulfill the great command to love others through radical acts of service. But also, Jesus says, the mission is to bear witness to the truth, to expose and name the selfish, sinful ways that we as humans treat each other, and to declare that in Jesus, God has saved the world through him because he loves it. He's opened up a new way to become human again. And so finally, Jesus predicts that there will be opposition. Just as the Jewish leaders rejected him, so his followers will be persecuted. But he tells them not to be afraid because he has already conquered or gained victory over the world. Now, what does Jesus mean by victory here? He doesn't say. But it leads us into the final section of the book where John shows us what victory looks like Jesus style. The Jewish leaders send soldiers to Jesus and his disciples to arrest him. And when the soldiers ask which one Jesus is, he declares, I am. And they fall backward. Now, this is brilliant on John's part. These words are the culmination of two sets of seven instances where Jesus has used that very phrase. And it all highlights one of John's core claims about Jesus. The words I am, or in Greek, ego and me, they're the Greek translation of the Hebrew personal covenant name of God that was revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. It was also repeated many times in Isaiah. And John has strategically placed seven moments in his story where Jesus says, I am, followed by some astounding claim. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. And John's also designed seven other stories that have key moments where Jesus says simply, I am, echoing this divine name. And so here, this occurrence, as Jesus is arrested, it's the ironic climax of all of them, because Jesus reveals his divine name and power and victory precisely at the moment that he gives up his life. 
After this, Jesus is put on trial for his exalted claims to be the Son of God and the King of Israel, first before the high priest and then before the Roman governor Pilate, who has to take seriously anyone who's charged with claiming to be the King of Israel. And Jesus tells Pilate that my kingdom is not from this world, meaning that he is a king and that his kingdom is for this world, but it's radically different value system, it's redefinition of power and greatness. None of this is derived from this world. Rather, they are defined by God's character that Jesus has revealed through his upside-down kingdom, which is epitomized by the cross. It's the place where the world's true king conquers sin and evil by letting it conquer him. And Jesus gains victory over the world through an act of self-giving love. After this, Jesus' body is placed in a tomb that is then sealed. And on the first day of the week, Mary and then later the other disciples discover that the tomb is strangely open and then empty. And then Mary, all of a sudden, she meets Jesus. He's alive from the dead. Now, the resurrection of Jesus connects back to another pattern of sevens in John's gospel. So all the way back at the wedding party in Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, John told us that that was Jesus' first sign. And he also identified the second sign, the healing of the sick boy in chapter 4. But after this, John just lets you keep count. And if you have, you'll have noticed that the sixth sign was the raising of Lazarus from the tomb, which Jesus performed at the cost of his own life. And so that and all of the signs, they point forward to this seventh and greatest sign at the culmination of the story, Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. It vindicates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, the author of all life, whose love has conquered death itself. After the empty tomb, Jesus then meets up with all the disciples, and he commissions them by sending the Spirit as he promised, so that his mission from the Father can now be carried on through them. After this, the book concludes with an epilogue that explores the ongoing mission of Jesus' disciples in the world. So a number of them are fishing, and they're not catching anything. And so Jesus appears to them on the shore. They don't recognize him, though. And he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the boat. And when they obey him, they catch a huge amount of fish, and it's only then that they recognize him as Jesus. Now John's offering here a picture of discipleship to Jesus. His followers will be most effective in the world when their focus is not on their work as such, but on simply listening for Jesus' voice and obeying him when he speaks. That's when they will truly see him at work in their lives. After this, Jesus talks with Peter and then commissions him as a unique leader in the Jesus movement, indicating that he too will give up his life one day. But in contrast to Peter, the last moments of the story focus on the author of this gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And unlike Peter, his job was not to lead the Jesus movement, but rather to spend his long life bearing witness to Jesus so that others might believe in him. And that's actually what he's done right here by authoring this amazing story about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's what the Gospel of John is all about. That was chock full of information, and now we are going to be off to the races. The theme of this passage for this study tonight is uh, found in John chapter 5, where it says uh, in verses 39 to 40, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. John is writing this so that he can prove without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is deity, that he is God, and then knowing that he is God, believing in Jesus so that they may have life. Um, In doing this, we saw this in the video, he's going to set forth seven miraculous signs that Jesus does uh, for the purpose of believing in Jesus Christ. Um, let's look at the, an outline survey of John, though, real quick. It's in, it's in Israel, where it takes place. Um, and we're going to break it down into five different sections here. The, the first one is in the first chapter, verses 1 through 18. Uh, this is basically John's introduction to who Christ is uh, in his nature um, and, and showing 
the nature of Jesus, his forerunner, who is John the Baptist, his mission, uh, and notes also the rejection and the acceptance that he will find during his ministry. Uh, then we move on to the next section of, of John is, is roughly verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 19 through, through the fourth chapter. And this is where the presentation of the Son of God takes place. And that's uh, where he begins his, his uh, seven miracles. This is where John the Baptist is questioned directly about who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus starts to call his disciples in this section. There's Cana. The wedding at Cana happens, and that's his uh, first miracle there. That is the, the sign uh, that's pointing to who he is. In this section, he meets with Nicodemus in that very famous meeting. Uh, and then that's where the John 3.16 passage comes that we all know. An interesting part here for me as I was studying this, John the Baptist is different from many uh, people that had followers of that day in that he was giving away his followers to Jesus Christ. He directed them to Jesus. Instead of, on the opposite side of that, the Pharisees were actually wanting to keep their followers. John is saying, no, this is the one I spoke about. Go to him. Follow him. This is also the section where the Sumerian woman um, is found and the healing uh, miracle. The next section is opposition begins to the Son of God. And, uh, And so, let's see here. John starts to record the reactions of belief and disbelief that happens after he performs miracles. And he starts to show that the, the opposition is becoming more and more intense and that it will culminate in the cross. And there are several parts in this section where, um, where his for, it's, there's a foreshadowing of the crucifixion that comes. Let's go back, though. I want to just hit real quick the presentation section of the Son of God, and let's just hit those, those uh, seven signs that symbolized uh, who Jesus was. <clears throat> and that was one, in chapter two, water to wine. Uh, in chapter four, the healing of a nobleman's son. In chapter five, healing the paralytic. And then each of these has kind of a, a message with it as well. So when he turns the water to wine, He's showing that, uh, that the ritual of law is being re- replaced by uh, the reality of grace. When he heals the nobleman's son, he's showing the gospel brings spiritual restoration. When he heals the paralytic, it's to show that weakness is being replaced by strength. Feeding the, the multitude, Christ satisfies spiritual hunger. Walking on water, in chapter 6, the Lord uh, transforms fear to faith. Uh, The sight of the man born blind, or or sight being brought to the man born blind. Jesus overcomes darkness and brings in light. And then raising of of Lazarus, uh, the gospel brings people from death to life. And John uses these seven here uh, to show that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Now, back to the, the opposition portion of that. Um, this is where uh, miracles you'll see you, you start to see that the miracles and the, the video mentions this start to polarize the people there are some that believe and then there are some that say n- n- no no we're going to keep our following and it's in this section in this in this chapters 5 through 12 there's a moment um, and I think I've got it in our yeah, here we go. John chapter 11, um, Caiaphas is actually speaking in verses uh, 51 to 52 because the Pharisees have met and they're like, what are we going to do about this? Well, Caiaphas is the high priest at this time. And he goes, uh, uh, in chapter 51 to 52, it says, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And in verse 53, it's not up there. It says, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. The Pharisees, from that day on, they started plotting his death. So that's where the, the opposition really ramped up. Uh, and then there's something interesting. That's over a period of several years up through chapter 12. And then it takes a turn in chapter 13 
uh, 13 to 17, because now we see that there's the preparation of the disciples. And this is only in the last, few, the, the last few hours of his life, and it's taking up a big bulk of John. He takes the, the, the apostles aside, the disciples aside, and he says, all right, now I'm going to prep you for when I'm going to be gone very soon. Um, and so it's there, that, and the video mentioned this, that it's there that he starts to, to prepare them, to, to arm them, if you will, and then to, to tell them, to encourage them that there's going to be resources that are coming that, that you don't have right now, and that resource is the Holy Spirit. In fact, in, the, in that section, he actually says, it's better for you that I go away because when I leave, then the Spirit is going to come and empower you. Uh, and so I think that to me, that is a real, that's a crux of that time with him is that he is communicating, it's better for you that I leave because if I do, then the Holy Spirit will come. And, and also there's some key themes in that passage where he's, uh, the, the high priestly prayer is, in the, is there, uh, but he's talking about servanthood and what that's going to look like the Holy Spirit, and, and, and how they're going to know when that happens, and then what abiding in Christ looks like. It goes from there directly to the crucifixion and resurrection part of, of John and the narrative there. Um, and so, going back to the, the other part here, where he's prepping them, he prays, and the, and the, the video mentions this, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, through the, the disciples' word. And so, again, we see that major theme, uh, and I'm bouncing all over the place with my slides here, and I, I'm sorry about that. The major theme, though, is so that people will believe that Jesus is the Christ and seeing that, believe. But uh, going back to the, to the crucifixion part now, um, <clears throat> so that's where we're at, and John uh, closes his gospel with a particularly detailed account of the post-resurrection appearances of the Lord. And the resurrection, as the video mentioned, being the ultimate sign that points to Jesus as the Son of God. Now, that's kind of an outline of the whole thing. Now let's go back and let's, let's look at the, uh, uh, some more um, the introduction and title of John here. So just like, uh, just like a coin has two sides, uh, Jesus Christ has two natures. And one of those was shown very clearly in Luke where he, he proves that Jesus Christ uh, is human, that he was fully man, that he calls him the son of man. Now, John does the opposite of that. He's going to portray Christ in his deity as the son of God. And John's purpose is crystal clear to set forth that Christ in his deity in order to spark, and there's a purpose for that too, is that that's in order to spark belief and faith in the readers. Now, the, the author of John um, is John. And now, in the, in his, in the book of, of John, he's, he's, he never calls him by name, but it's the disciple that Jesus loved. And that, and that name is used over and over again. Um, Jesus, in Mark uh, chapter 3, he, he nicknames James and John, um, he nicknames them uh, Boanerges. I think that's how you say that, the sons of thunder. And, uh, and we also see that, um, that their father was Zebedee, and their mother's name was Salome, okay? And they served Jesus in Galilee and were present at his crucifixion. So in Mark chapter 15, we see uh, the next slide there that there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joses and Salome. So Salome was there. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. So Salome was ministering to him. And there were also many other women who came up with, from Jerusalem. And John was evidently among the, the Galileans who followed John the Baptist until they were called to follow Jesus. Okay, so in Luke chapter 5, uh, we've got that, that um, narrative of the fishing, and, and Jesus goes and he says, hey, you know, put your nets over here, and they make this giant haul. Well, in verse 9, it says, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So these guys were partners with Peter. And, uh, and Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. So John was there um, 
at that time when, when that, when that uh, great catch of fish took place. And John was among the 12 men who were selected to be apostles. In, in Luke chapter 6, we see that uh, in verse 14 and 15, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So John is one of these that were called there in Luke chapter 6. And after Christ's ascension, John became one of the, the pillars of the church, as, as it's mentioned in Galatians chapter 2. You see there uh, where Paul's writing. He says, when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnab Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So John is mentioned in, Gal in, in Galatians by Paul as being one of the pillars of the church. He's also mentioned several times uh, by name in Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 3, in Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 8, all of these times in association with Peter. Now, uh, it also seems that John um, went to Ephesus and then eventually was exiled by the Romans to the island of Patmos. And we see that in Revelation chapter 1 where uh, he says, I, John, your brother... Um, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so the date and setting of John. Um, there's been some argumentation about when this was actually written. Up until recently, there was some, some new, uh, a, a new discovery of a papyrus um, found in Egypt, which actually had some quotes that, that were quoting John. And so... As, I'm not going to go through all the details of that, but to, be, uh, to make it a long story short, it's basically agreed now that this was written around 60 to 90 A.D. And by this time, John would have been one of the last surviving eyewitnesses of the Lord. And according uh, to, to the tradition, and, and most scholars agree that John wrote this gospel while in Ephesus. And... Uh, Throughout the book, as we've already mentioned, John um, was, is mentioned as the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you can see that in John 13, John 20, John 21, and uh, John chapter 19. Well, here's, this is interesting to me. And um, Norman, if you're trying to catch up, let's go to John chapter 2, 6 on that slide. Um, Another thing that points to John as the author and the timing of all of this is his knowledge of the Palestinian geography and the Jewish customs, uh, which makes it clear that he was a Palestinian Jew. And this is interesting, his meticulous attention to numbers and names. So look in, if we look at John chapter 2, verse 6, he said, There were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Um, and then... John chapter 6, they gathered, gathered them up into 12 baskets and fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Um, so it, it seems that John had an eye for numbers, an eye for detail, and then also an eye for uh, a memory for names because in John chapter 1, he says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophet wrote, prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then further down, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And then, and then again in chapter 11, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So John had not only a, uh, a very distinct recollection of, of things like the number of pots and uh, the number of baskets at the miracle, but also the names of people that were happening and taking place. And all of this uh, kind of points to and indicates that he was an eyewitness of those things. And that fits his own claim to be a witness of the, the events that he describes uh, throughout the book. In, chap in chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter 19, he says, uh, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, speaking of himself. He knows that he is telling the truth that you may also believe. And then in chapter 21, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So John claims to himself as an eyewitness of these things. 
Now, one of, the, one of the ways that we know that John wrote this and that it wasn't Peter or it wasn't James is, is kind of the time period in which it happened. And also in Acts chapter 12, uh, it, sh- it says that about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Um, this happened too early. This happened before uh, John was written, and so it could not have been James. And uh, the author is referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's different from who Peter was. And so the only three left, uh, the only person left that it could have been was John. And so it, it is, it's pretty clear as we look at all of the different um, evidences in the book that John was the author of this. And I don't think there was any question in our minds about that, but just to know um, the reasons and, and the evidence for that, I think is good. Now, let's go back to the theme and purpose of John. As we've stated, uh, the theme can be found in John chapter 20, verse 31, where it says, but these are written that you, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, leave, by believing you may have life in his name. So, uh, John selected those seven signs that we showed um, so that there could be some intellectual and spiritual conviction okay, about the Son of God. And uh, the key verb in John is believe, and it requires both knowledge, so knowledge about all of these things that he's... That he's uh, uh, so knowledge... Things, not just knowledge, but volition or action place and that's the believing um so in john chapter 8 it says and you will know the truth the truth sets you free i feel like i'm losing my mic here so can we just go with this one okay you good hello test test one two so in john chapter 8 is that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free speaking of the knowledge that has to come I like that other mic better, for, for sure. And then uh, John chapter 1, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So that's speaking of the belief that comes in, in knowing uh, who he is and seeing and getting that knowledge. Um, Let's see here. The predominant theme of this gospel then is that there's a dual response that happens. We kind of talked about the polarizing effect of his, of his ministry. And the dual response is faith from some and then unbelief in others. And then he speaks, but, but John speaks to both of those reactions. Uh, in John chapter 3 it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. And I, I find that, that word remains rather interesting. Um, that's for a whole other discussion. But uh, indicating that the wrath of God is on all until we see and believe in Jesus Christ. But those who do not, the wrath of God remains on, on them. So there are several passages which indicate that those reactions, those dual reactions are taking place throughout his ministry. Um, one of those is in John chapter 5. It's a long passage, but right there in verse 24, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And then uh, in John chapter 10, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So then, uh, not only do they have knowledge of Christ, they know who the shepherd is, but there's action involved with that. They follow Christ. So there's, there's knowledge and there's action. And then John chapter 1, uh, verse 11 and 12 uh, show, says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So there's that other one, rejection. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, they acted and they believed. He gave the right to become children of God. Now, it's interesting to note, too, that this, this gospel is not only for evangelism, but it's also designed to build believers in, in, our, in our faith and understanding of spiritual principles. So it is all about evangelism. It's very much an evangelistic book. 
But it's also for us to be, to be clear and certain that when we look at it and we read it, that we can see, yes, Jesus is the Christ. He is who he says he was. In Luke, we can see, yeah, he was man. He was fully man. But, and when we read John, we can see, but now I believe for certain that he was fully God as well. So not only is it evangelistic, but it's meant for us to have uh, assurance of our faith in who Christ is as God. Now, some of the keys to John. The key phrase is that Jesus is the Son of God. And the key verses that, that we'll look at for that is in John chapter 1, uh, 11 through 13, that he says he came to his own, and we, we looked at this already, and his own people did not, did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And in John chapter 20, <clears throat> Uh, it says, but these, and we've, we've looked at this verse again already in 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, by believing you may have life in his name. Now, John chapter 3 is where uh, Jesus is, is meeting with Nicodemus, and everyone is, he's, is familiar with that passage, and that, and that critical verse in John 3.16 is the most is is really the simplest it's the gospel at its core in its simplest form the salvation is a gift of god and obtainable only through belief uh and this conversation kind of sets sets up that that phrase being born again um and what that means and and how that that's how we get into the kingdom of god now let's get to the to the seeing jesus in john okay and I know that I'm racing through this stuff, guys, but, uh, and I'm probably, I know we're not doing this justice, but uh, let's, let's just, let's plow ahead. I found this interesting as I was looking at these passages that seeing Jesus in John, um, most of the way that we see who Jesus is is by his own statements. And the video references all of those I am statements, and we're going to just kind of take a look at a few of those. Um, in John chapter nine, uh, the the Jesus has 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 done has healed a man. He healed his his eyesight, and and he's and the guy's saying that they got healed. He said the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes, and said to me, "Go to Siloam and wash." So I went and I washed and I received my sight. So in here we we see that there's there's testimony of a man called Jesus, who who has healed this man. And then uh, also we see that Jesus is the Holy One of God. And if we look in John chapter 6, Simon Peter testified to this, that, that Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and, and we've believed. And we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter there testifying of who Jesus was. And then on certain occasions, Jesus equates himself with the Old Testament, I am, or Yahweh, in John chapter 4, um, he's the, uh, verse 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And again in John chapter 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And again and again, he references himself as that I am that's referenced in the Old Testament. In John chapter 8 again, uh, and then John chapter 13, he says, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, also, the deity of Christ can be seen in his seven I am statements, and it's, these are mentioned in that video as well. Um, in John chapter six, verse thirty-five, he says, "I." Jesus said to them, "I am the bread of life." So this is one of his "I am" statements. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then, um, also, he says, "I am the light of the world." In John chapter eight, verse twelve. Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then in John chapter seven, I mean John chapter ten, verse seven, he says, I am the door. 
So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The video, I think, says, referenced it as, I am the gate of the sheep. Um, and then uh, in John chapter 10, that same, uh, same passage there, he says, I am the good shepherd. So that's another one of his I am statements. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then in the next chapter, John 11, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Another one of his I am statements. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And then in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So there he is making another I am assumption that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then we get to John chapter 15. In, in verse 1 he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So there he, he speaks of, of himself being the vine. And then, he, and then he speaks of, he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And then he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So the seven signs that we've cited previously uh, and the five witnesses are from chapter... Let's look at chapter uh, 5, verses 30 to 40. There are five witnesses here to, to Jesus um, in this little passage right here. They, uh, they point to his divine character. Um, in the, in, let's just read through this real quick. It says um, in verse 30, it says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my, my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So here's, here we go. Here's the first witness. is Jesus of himself. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. But he, he's witnessing about himself. In verse 32, we go on and see that God the Holy Spirit is implied. There is another who bears witness about me. And that's when he was speaking to the, um, when he speaks to the disciples later. He's saying, when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come and indwell you and, and testify of me as well. Okay, and then in verse 33 through 35, he speaks about John the Baptist being a witness to him. Um, and it says in, in verse 35 that he is born witness to the truth. Uh, and then in verse 36, he says, uh, not only that, but my, my works testify about me. So, But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I'm doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. <clears throat> and then in verse 37, it says, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, for, for uh, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for do you, you do not believe the one whom he has sent. This right here, this, this verse 39 is just, uh, it's so poignant. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So he's saying here, listen, you guys feel, you guys think that, that you can memorize this, this scripture and that that is eternal life, that this, the word you have is eternal life, but I'm standing right in front of you. What, the word that you're memorizing, it's right here, and yet you refuse to see it. Um, so these scriptures also point to his divine character. And in John 1.1, 1, 1, as it was referenced in the video, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in John chapter 8, it says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Another one of those I am references. Uh, in John chapter 14, I'm sorry. Well, throughout John, there are references. In John, let's look at, look at John 20 real quick. It says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. So there Thomas is witnessing to, uh, to us about the nature of Jesus Christ. And we can see that the word was God. 
And the word also became flesh uh, in John 1 there. John 1, 14, we see that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The humanity of Jesus can also be seen in his weariness. In John chapter 4, verse 6, uh, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And then in the next verse, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Again, speaking of his humanity. And then in chapter 5, uh, <coughs> excuse me. He says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Speaking of his dependence upon the Father. And then chapter 11, we see that he grieves just like we do, speaking to his humanity, where he wept, he weeps over the death of Lazarus. And then chapter 12, he, his soul is troubled um, because he's starting to approach that hour where he has to, to die. And he says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. And then we can see again, um, as he continues to the cross, his anguish and death showing again his, his humanity as he anguish, as he just, he, he suffers physically during that death. Now the contribution of John to the Bible, um, John is very selective and more topical and not quite as uh, um, chronological much more theological in its, in its nature. Um, also, and I, I didn't realize this until I started looking at this, John doesn't contain any parables. Um, he instead uses allegories where he talks about the good shepherd and the true vine. So um, instead of using parables, he's, he's, uh, he's using um, parallelism, like light versus darkness, uh, and so it's a little more poetic than the other the other gospels. <clears throat> um, it's interesting too because John uh, mentions in chapter twenty one. He says, "Now there are also uh, many other things that Jesus did." And he says, "Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written." So uh, he picks and chooses very carefully, and he crafts his gospel very. Uh, very um, purposefully to show those those signs that he did to point to, to Jesus's deity um, and I felt this was interesting too of the eight miracles in chapters 1 through 12 and in 21 the only one that's uh, let's see the only the, the feeding of the multitude and the walking on the water are found in the other three gospels so he's picking out different different uh, signs to show than the other three gospels did and again, that's for the purpose of showing Jesus Christ's deity. Um, so, uh, in closing, John is very evangelistic. And again, I just want to point to the, uh, the purpose of the Gospel of John is to show Jesus' deity, and not only that, to reveal truth, to give knowledge of Jesus as God, and uh, not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but knowledge for the sake of volition or for the sake of action, and that is to believe. And then as we see him go throughout the, all the signs, that creates uh, polarization. It creates uh, both acceptance and following and a rejection, which culminates in his uh, um, crucifixion and resurrection, which, as the video uh, shows, was the ultimate sign that Jesus was who he said he was, uh, fully God. Any comments tonight? You notice I said any comments. 